And the final section is my plan anyway of chapter 10 as that sun comes up. Page 217. More about listening. We have always known that when people talk about something that distresses them, they become upset. We notice their breathing rate increases or becoming irregular. We notice their skin color changing. We see their muscles stiffen. And if they are like Jack Harrington, we sometimes see a muscle twitch or jerk out of their control. Systematic scientific observation has proved that these phenomena, phenomena are evidence of stress and that stress is reflected in psychological changes such as higher blood pressure and a faster pulse. The scientific research has proved unambiguously that stress is implicated to some degree in all physical and emotional wellness illness. I'm sorry. What we did not know prior to the invention of the continuous computerized heart monitor was that the act of talking itself, no matter what about, causes the same physiological effects. James J. Lynch directs a clinic for patients with high blood pressure at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. He was not looking for language related phenomena when he prescribed 24 hour oh heart monitors for these patients. It was simply part of the process of diagnosis and treatment. The discoveries he made that blood pressure rises when you talk and falls when you listen were accidental byproducts, but they were then energetically pursued by Lynch and his associates, who were amazed to find that although blood pressure rises much more steeply when speakers are emotionally involved, it also rises during the most innocuous speech. In fact, it rises if speakers are doing nothing more than reading a telephone, directly, telephone directory aloud um, that's a telephone book for those who don't know that. The same effect occurs during signing. For deaf speakers, it is absent in schizophrenics. I'm busy here this morning, and here comes that sun. The phenomena are so reliable that Lynch has been able to teach people with high blood pressure to moderate it by their language behavior alone a matter of grave importance for patients who cannot tolerate the unusual diets and medicines prescribed for the disease. It's critical to understand that the beneficial effects of listening, not only a lower blood pressure, but also slower pulse and improved chemical regulation of body processes at every level. Oh, there that sun is. Actually feel the warm from it. But also slower pulse and improved chemical regulation of body processes at every level occur only during real listening. If you are rehearsing in your mind what you are going to say when you get the turn to speak or talking to yourself silently on some other subject, or sitting on the edge of your chair desperately trying to grab the turn, the benefits do not occur. They are the result of syntonic listening and when you give the speaker your full attention. Listening, <clears throat> listening therefore is not, <clears throat> excuse me, Listening, therefore, is not only crucial to effective communication, it is a major component in personal stress management. 
right up there with meditation and biofeedback and massage and many expensive trendy processes. Listening is not something you should consider because it constitutes being nice. Listening is your own self-interest. Listening is good for your physical and your emotional health and is actively and directly therapeutic. Listening, which is free, is therefore a multiple blessing in your life. It causes people who interact with you to perceive you as interested, as considerate, as caring, and as linguistically competent. It enables you to obtain the information you need in order to tailor your own speech for maximum efficiency and effectiveness. At the same time, it preserves your health and sanity. The time you spend learning to listen properly is one of the most valuable investments you could ever make. Goodness, that's so bright. Taking out the trash. Well, good morning. You don't keep garbage in your house or on your person. The crisis caused by lack of a way to get rid of garbage at any level is acute. But the very parents and teachers who train us in the disposal of every other sort of waste leave us to our own devices when it comes to dealing with linguistic waste. Most of this book has dealt with external language toxins, but there are also internal ones, personal ones that are just as nasty to have around. We produce these toxins and dangerous, waste, dangerous wastes while talking to ourselves, something all of us do almost nonstop, usually silently when we aren't talking to somebody else. We create little tape recordings in our heads with unpleasant happenings preserved on them. And then we play them over and over so that the unpleasantness is perpetuated. Therapist, Albert Ellis, for example, with his rational emotive therapy, spend lots of time trying to teach people not to produce those tapes. Most people never get such training, but without going to a therapist, you can do a lot to take out your personal linguistic trash and dispose of it. Here are some suggested techniques that may many people have found helpful. The letter you do not mail. When you would like to tell somebody off, but good reasons exist for refraining from doing so, Go home and write a letter in which you say every single thing you want to say, but do not mail it. Any letter written in anger or the heat of emotion should sit unmailed for at least 24 hours and be reviewed when you've calmed down. You may then decide not to mail it either. It may seem to you that this takes a lot of time and energy that could be better spent in other activities wrong. What it does is get rid of trash in your head that would otherwise keep rotting away there, leading to the production of tapes that replay the conflict over and over again and seriously interfere with your other activities. Get it out of your system instead. Write it all down. If you don't like to write, put it all on a cassette tape. <laughs> But get rid of it by making it external rather than internal so that you can dispose of it. Now you have this letter or tape that you aren't going to mail or share. What should you do with it? You have two choices depending on how objective you are capable of being. If you are able to look at yourself in a detached and rational way, once a little time has gone by, Keeping these items can be very useful. Going back and reviewing them twice a year will let you observe what kinds of things cause you to become upset or angry. 
how well their importance correlates with the intensity of your response, how much, if at all, this changes over time, and so on. It may let you spot patterns that provide you with valuable information about yourself. If this is true for you, I suggest that you keep your letters or tapes. They will then function much as a journal does, but in a specialized area of your life. Get a three ring binder, name it Hostility Dump, and file the letters or tapes away inside. You could buy plastic pages for three ring binders that will hold six cassette tapes at a time. Put the journal somewhere that ensures its privacy and use it well. But suppose you are not detached and rational. Suppose that when you reread one of these letters or listen to one of those tapes six months later, you become just as distressed as you were originally. Or suppose you find yourself thinking that it's a terrible waste to hide anything so brilliant and being tempted to send it off to one of the publications in your field. I see articles in professional journals from time to time that have obviously resulted from just such a judgment. Suppose that instead of helping, you learn about yourself. Having the letters or tapes available for review only adds to the stress in your life. In that case, destroy the letters or tapes at once. Create them, read them over, or listen to them as many times as may be necessary to achieve the feeling that you are through with them. And then destroy them. For you, keeping them would be a serious mistake. Talking to the plastic head. Another way to get rid of linguistic wastes is by talking to something inanimate that can stand in for the real world counterpart. My favorite choice is one of those plastic, often styrofoam heads you can buy anywhere that wigs are sold. Set it up at a proper height for the purpose, stand back, and give it hell. This is especially useful when you know very well that what has upset you is trivial, and you just want to get rid of it quickly. When it's not worth preparing a letter or tape about, and it's useful if you are someone who should not keep the letters or tapes, but you don't trust yourself to destroy them. Translation exercises. In addition to the language associated with words, there are other languages which can be used to express meaning. There are the languages of art, of sculpture, of crafts, of dance, of music, etc. You may want to translate the stress source in your life into one of these languages instead, or in addition to writing it down or recording it. In my own case, for example, I reach a point where I cannot face even one more word. My professional life consists entirely of reading words, saying words, listening to words, writing words, and analyzing words. Sometimes I grow profoundly sick of words, and everything to do with it. At such times, I translate anything that's bothering me into a collage. I can't draw or paint or sculpt, but I can cut and paste, and my mailbox provides me with an endless supply of collage materials. I don't consider any mail except pornographic mail and the letters that come from genuinely wild-eyed hate groups to be junk mail. It's all collage material. Choose the medium that is most accessible for you and in which you feel you can best express your meaning. Uh, last one. Listening again to music. Music has come to be recognized as one of the most powerful of all languages, not just in the aesthetic sense, not just in terms of the well-known motivating effects of marches, those still remain, of course. But music has now been proved to be actively therapeutic. It reduces the amount of pain-killing drugs patients require, even during and after surgery. It shortens the time people must spend in hospitals. 
It provides an alternative means of communication in speech disorders and deficits. It's often surprising how well people who are unable to speak may be able to sing. It can provide the same relaxation and stress reduction that listening or meditation provide. Music is good for you personally. Provided you listen to it. Just having it playing in the background, as with canned music tapes, is not enough. That may cause people to work faster in an office or buy more goods in a grocery store. Such effects for background music are well established, but it won't improve your physical and mental health to get the full benefits of music, just as is true for the benefit of any other form of listening. You must give it your attention. Any kind of instrumental music will do for this purpose, not just classical or new age. Marches will do. Popular, popular music or rock and roll as long as it's only melodies and no words, and you don't know the words so well that you supply them as you listen. Whatever music you like and have, whoa, whoa, whoa. Whatever music you can listen to with pleasure if you don't know precisely what you might like and have no preferences, I have three recommendations. The instrumental music of Bach and Al Benoni. Number two, any Gregorian chant. And three, Brahms compositions for violin. And if you try these and you find that they upset you in the same way an argument does, please try other varieties until you find something that works for you. I think I can make it through the other part. I did not make it to the end of 10. But I wanted to. We'll see. It's pretty warm out here, so my thing's probably going to shut down on me. So we'll start on this. The man-woman problem. Life is not easy for women at the moment. Today, and so many women must work, whether they like it or not. But when our culture continues to assign them the primary responsibility for such things as child care, the care of elders, and the emotional work of marriage and family, women need all the help they can get. Unfortunately, many things allegedly created for the specific purpose of providing such help turn out to be created for the specific, oops, turn out to be at best full of potential pitfalls, and at worst actively dangerous to women. Assertiveness training, for example. Certainly there are fine assertiveness trainers out there with the very best of intentions who are working hard to make things better for women. Certainly women do need to learn to stand up for their rights and to express themselves without being doormats. But there is a very serious problem when assertiveness training or anything of the same genre is provided to women without any accompanying training in basic political skills. Let me sum this up as emph emphatically as I know how. If you always say the wrong thing, assertiveness training will only teach you how to say the wrong thing far more openly and articulately. This is not an improvement. First, get your communication act together. Then you may find assertive, assertiveness training very valuable. Let's take a look at scenario for an all too common situation in which this problem is clearly demonstrated. Scenario 14. Mr. Nelson, Janet said, I don't think you understand the problem that I'm facing every single day. I don't think you have any grasp on what they are like and I don't think Meta Mega is making any effort to help with them. Paul Nelson looked at her hard, and his eyebrows rose, but when he answered, he didn't seem annoyed. I see, he said. Well, why don't you help me out then, Janet? Tell me what it is that we're missing, and perhaps I can do something about it. In the first place, she began, when I get up in the morning, I can't just eat breakfast and go to work. I have small children at home 
that have to be dressed and fed and driven to their sitter's house before I can even begin to think about coming here. I get up at five, Mr. Nelson, in order to be here by nine o'clock. And even then, it's difficult. If Metamega really cared about its women employees, it would have childcare available on site so that we won't really already be worn out before we even get here. And so we could concentrate on our work instead of worrying about our kids all day long. Nelson shook his head and she was pleased to see signs of genuine concern on his face. How many children do you have, Janet? He asked. And when she told him, he made a careful note and told her courteously to continue. I also have an elderly mother-in-law to look after, she said. My husband means well, but it's hard for him to find time to check on her or to pick up her medicines or anything else she needs. And I am not willing to neglect her just because his schedule is so complicated. Well, good for you, said Paul. I am glad to hear that. And that's not all. Oh, there's more. There certainly is. She ran through the list, being very careful not to seem overly dramatic about any of it, presenting the information concisely and logically. Through it all, Paul Nelson listened with scrupulous attention, nodding his head and making sympathetic noises. By the time she got to the end of it, she was feeling confident and hopeful. She knew how good he was at accomplishing the seemingly impossible. His support would be very valuable to her and to the other women at Metamega who shared her concerns. Well, Janet, he said when she was through, you have certainly opened my eyes. I intended to, she replied. Something has to be done. He sighed and leaned back in his chair, looking at her over steepled fingers. Janet, he said solemnly, I have always suspected that women, especially women with family obligations, have no business being anywhere except at home with those families. That's considered an old-fashioned and outmoded view, I know. But it's one that has seemed compelling to me. And now you've convinced me. No question about it. Nobody could handle all those problems that you've been trying to deal with. But Mr. Nelson... He cut her off. Don't you worry about a thing, he said. You don't even have to give notice, Janet. If you can give us a week and maybe show one of the other secretaries... The things that you have been have been your personal responsibility will manage. Okay, this was not what Janet had in mind, of course. Now she faces a degrading scene in which she must plead with Paul Nelson for her job and convince him that she can get her work done in spite of all her personal problems. And she has dug this pit by herself for herself. Nelson is too skilled in the use of language and in game playing to say, you poor little thing. But that is the standard line in interactions like scenario 14 with minor variations for poor old things, poor dears, and poor kids. When a woman appears before a superior with a list of the standard personal problems, assertiveness only makes things worse. A man who might be sympathetic to a woman in tears will respond as Nelson did when the case is made assertively. A woman is just as likely to be unsympathetic because she has all the same problems to deal with and she has managed. This is all wrong. You bet. Women ask me, why is it that when a man asks for help because a wife or child or parent is sick, he almost always gets it? And even if he doesn't get the help, he gets sympathy. But when a woman has the same problem, she's expected to tough it out. The answer lies in the set of reality statements our culture uses to define men and to define women. When a woman complains about problems associated with doing things that are expected of women, sympathy is unlikely. Men get very little sympathy for complaints that work is too physically demanding or that hours too long or that they are frightened because a set of reality statements includes 
Men are physically strong. Men have great physical endurance. And men are always brave. The difference is, of course, that few men are required to wrestle tigers, while a very large percentage of women are obliged to carry a heavy load of family duties in addition to their duties in the workplace. You can't change this situation. You can't revise our current version of reality to make it more palatable. The task is the task of decades, if not centuries. But you can be aware that the poor little thing, Ploy, is lurking about. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and avoid walking headfirst into it. Instead, sit down and work out a careful strategy that does not leave you so vulnerable. One more thing. Recently, there's been a flood of books about uh, man-woman relationships. <coughs> Newsweek for June 1st, 1987, calls it a new multi-million dollar publishing phenomenon in which writers are still mining the apparently inexhaustible plight of being a woman. But they're starting to blame most of women's problems on men. <coughs> All right, thank you for listening. I'm going to have to stop here.